Let's go to size for prayer. Our Father, we thank you very much for today. Thank you for your word. I pray, Lord, as we look at your word again on leadership today, you lead us in the right way, in the right direction, in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, you make us to be patient in your presence, not to be in a hurry, but just to sink in and to take in the totality of your word as you are teaching us in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. You will notice that I've been talking on leadership for some time now. And as the Lord gives the insight and the revelation, I still intend to continue for some weeks. Leadership is very important in the word of God. And in fact, uh, the church of the living God, the body of Christ, the assembly of the saints, will not go very far except something is done with the leadership. As you look at the book of the prophet Isaiah, you come to find the situation of the children of Israel. And it comes as a surprise to you as we begin to read from chapter 1. In chapter 1, reading from verse 4, A sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evil doers, children that are corrupters, and then it says they are forsaking the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. As you look at that verse, and you see the spiritual condition of the children of Israel, and the prophet cries aloud, and he says, Ah, this has become a sinful nation. And they become the children of evil doers. And then he says, They had forsaken the Lord. They knew the Lord before. They had the grace of God before. And they were right in the, under the wings of the shadow of the Almighty before. But now he said, they had forsaken the Lord. And they had provoked the Holy One of Israel. It says, they've gone away backward. As you look at that, you will see that the problem was a problem of leadership. Israel became backsliding. And they forsook the Lord. And the spiritual life that was there before became destroyed because of the problem of leadership. And as we look at our church today, if uh, you are concerned about the lives of the people, the character of the people, the rebellion that you see all around you, and the lack of seriousness and zeal in the things of God, if you are concerned about the dwindling and the retrogressing and the going back of the spiritual life, and you begin to think and say, why? What's the matter? What's the problem? You're looking at the problem face to face right now. Look at yourself. You are the problem. Leadership is the problem. And that's what you find throughout the scriptures. And except we come to the realization that you are the problem. And as uh, you look at the word of God and you say, well, if we are the problem, if we are going to get back to where we were before, then something must happen to us. Look at uh, Isaiah chapter 3. See part of the problem. Verse 12. As for my people, children are their oppressors. Women rule over them. Oh, my people, they which lead thee, cause thee to err and destroy the way of thy parts. The children of Israel came to the position where the children now became their oppressors. They were ruling over them. And women also ruled over them. And in fact, even the men in the leadership to it says that they caused them to err. That is to go astray. Chapter 9, verse 16. In chapter 9, verse 16, for the leaders of these people caused them to err. And they that are led of them are destroyed. That's the problem. The problem of the strength of the church, the spiritual vitality of the church, the problem of rebellion in the church, the problem of backsliding in the church, the problem of lukewarmness in the church, the problem of sin increasing and righteousness decreasing in the church, the problem of frivolity and non-seriousness in the church can be traced to the leadership. 
because it says very well, very clearly, it says the leaders of these people cause them to go astray. And they that are led, the followers, the people, the disciples, they are destroyed. Isaiah chapter 56. Isaiah chapter 56. In verse 10, is watch men are blind. They are all ignorant. They are all dumb dogs. They cannot bark, sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. And so you see from all the passages we have read together, if anything is going to really take place in the church, if we're going to see the revival that the word of God has promised, then in everything we ought to address this issue and come back to the leadership. And I, you know that if there is a serious uh, problem, a serious sickness, it's going to take a real form hand. And it's going to take all of us agreeing together. We want the problem to be solved. And here on this uh, Tuesday night, if uh, you love the church and you love the Lord, whenever you come here to the Tuesday meeting, you want to ask the Lord, you want to find out where is the secret of going back to the place of revival. Where is the secret of going back to the place that the church ought to be? If you love the church, that will be in your heart. And then it will not be in your heart to be in a hurry. Because really, you know, you cannot dictate to God. You cannot tell God, tell me the secret of going back to where I'm coming from. In five minutes, in ten minutes, if you don't do that, I'm in a hurry. I'm going back home. And God says get up and go back home. I'll not reveal my mind to you. And uh, as I stand here, I want to cooperate with God. And I want to show God that I mean what I've been talking about, about patience, that we're going to stay in the presence of God. We want to find out. You understand? Coming all these 26 years and laying the foundation and then the people in this country, if you say you have deeper life, they say go. If you are on the road and a policeman meets you and they say where are your particulars? And then you show them your particulars and then they say okay, uh, it's alright, particular is uh, okay, but we're here standing in the sun. And nobody looks at us. And you are going up and down. And we are the people serving you here. Anyway, you understand, you are Nigerian. Bring the thing in your pocket. Oh, you say, what? I showed you everything I wanted to show you. Oh, they said, okay, pack there. And then you, you know what they are talking about. You understand? How many of you understand? <laughs> okay, God bless you. Then you stay there. After one hour, you see other people passing and giving them something, saying, oh, see, bye-bye. And then you're still standing there. And then they come to you after one hour and they say, what's the problem with you? Don't you see the people that are passing by? And then you say, I cannot do that. I'm a Christian. Then they say, which church do you go? I mean, in those years, 10 years ago. Then you say, deeper life. Get to your vehicle. You can go. Deeper life. They will never give bribe. And then you go. That's what you enjoyed. Because of the foundation we laid in deeper life. But now, it is not so. Because now, Deeper life members. Sometimes they can be worse than the other people on the street. And if you are concerned about such a situation, you want to come back to the Lord and say, Lord, give us back the righteousness, the holiness, the revival, the glory, the fire, the earnestness, the conviction, the place you put us over all the churches, that all the churches were looking at this church as a model. I will want the beacon light for everybody. You want to pray and say, God, bring us to the place where we were. And if the Lord is going to bring us to the place where we were, it's going to take the leadership of this church becoming sincere and becoming open to the Lord, saying, Oh Lord, we know that the problem is with us. When the problem is corrected in the midst of the leadership, it will be corrected in the church. And we thank God because as we look at the Bible, there are examples of leaders in the Bible. There is exhortation on the one hand, there is example on the other hand. And these examples show us that if God can use them 
to bring revival back to their own congregation at their own time. The Lord can use us today and he will use us in Jesus' name. God's word contains both exhortation and examples of good leaders approved of God that turned the hearts of their people back to the Lord. But you know, being a leader is a great responsibility. Number one, you have your individual life to live. And you must live as a Christian. Number two, you have the responsibilities of either a husband or a wife. Of a father or of a mother. Number three, there are duties to are carrying responsibilities in your place of work. And the people are looking up to you not to work as an ordinary person, but as a model man among men. Number four, now beyond and above all these, you happen to be a spiritual leader. And there are spiritual responsibilities in ministry. As a watchman over never dying souls, a ministry that carries eternal consequences. Such a calling is not for an ordinary person. It's not for a weak, careless, frivolous, inexperienced Christian. And except we're called and we're made to be qualified by God himself will be condemned at last, and we will not be rewarded on the last day. Well then, to be a leader that will fit into the situation that God is looking for now, that will put his neck under the yoke, that will bend down and bend low, that will come under the body, that will light the fire, and that will possess the zeal of the Lord to consume him, such a leader approved of God, one, will be fervent in prayers. Two, will be fearless in principles. Three, will be firm in purposes. Four, will be faithful in preaching. Let's look at three points. Number one, fervency in prayer. If we're going to bring back revival, and if we're going to bring back the church where the church ought to be, there will be fervency in prayer. Number two, fearlessness and firmness of purpose there will be a purpose in your heart we know where we're coming from we know what we have lost we want to regain everything we lost and we want to go beyond where we were before and then you make that firm purpose and you say come what may this purpose must be realized there will be fearlessness and firmness of purpose. Number three, faithfulness in preaching. Number one, fervency in prayer. If you want to be a leader that God will use, you will take up this great challenge. Because Christian leadership is a challenge. A challenge which is above the strongest of men and the wisest of men. Because the race is not for the sweet, swift. Neither is the race for the people that can run fast. It is for the people that are chosen of God. And then through prayer, God channels his power into your life. It is a spiritual responsibility. And the most intelligent of men cannot do without heaven's support and help. And how do you have that support and help? Through prayer. How can a Christian leader do the work he ought to do? How can his life be for men? How can his work and service among men? How can his ministry towards men? How can his administration and supervision over men? How can his counsel and teaching for men be effective and do a lasting, eternal, enduring spiritual work without prayer? We need to pray. And as the example we see in scripture, the people that were real leaders, leaders that were worth their calling, worth their salt. In Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. Verse 3. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. 
and I prayed unto the God, unto the Lord, my God. He set his face. There was a determination there. There was a devotion there. There was a dedication there. He set his face like a flint. He said, I know Satan wouldn't like this. He wouldn't want us to concentrate on prayer. And Satan doesn't like what we're talking about now. He doesn't like the church to come back to the place where God has put us. Satan doesn't like the leadership repenting and having restoration of everything that we have lost. Satan doesn't like our concentrating in prayer. Determining that we'll give what it will take. We're going to pray until we'll pray through. And so he will disturb. But Daniel said, I knew from experience... And I knew from history, the history of the scriptures, that if anything is going to turn, if anything is going to happen, there must be somebody that will hold on to the hand of the Almighty God. And that's what we need to realize today, that if the church is going to go back to where it was before, there will be need to pray. Let's look at another leader in Deuteronomy chapter 9. Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 18 through to verse 20. Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 18. And I fell down before the Lord as at the first. Forty days and forty nights I did neither eat bread nor drink water because of all your sins which ye sinned in doing wickedly in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. To remind you of the story, Moses went to the mount to collect the commandments of the Lord. Because actually what happened is this. In Exodus chapter 19, the Lord made a covenant with the people and said, if they will hearken indeed unto his word, there will be a peculiar treasure unto him. And then he said, go and tell the children of Israel those words. Moses went, he told the children of Israel those words. And Israel said, go back to God and tell the Lord. All that the Lord has said, we will do, we will obey. And Moses took their word back to the Lord. Then God said, if that is so, come up to the mount, and then I will give you the commandment for them. And he went to the mount, he went to the Lord. But before he came back, there was an Aaron there. The problem of leadership again. Oh, make us gods. For as for this, Moses, we do not know what has happened to him. And instead of that leader telling them to be patient, instead of that leader telling them to be steadfast in the Lord, instead of that leader telling them, but you said you are going to do the word of God and the will of God, he went to the mountain to receive the commandment for you. He said, break up the earrings and the ears of your sons and daughters. And then he fashioned a cow for them. And then God said, Moses, go back. Your people have corrupted themselves. They have not stayed in my word. They have not obeyed my word. They have gone back so quickly. And then he said, let me alone. Let my anger work out against them. I will disinherit them. I will destroy them. Then I will make out of you a great nation. Then Moses began to pray. That's the prayer we're talking about. Not praying for yourself. Not because you have some little, little problems, some little pebbles in your shoe, and some little inconvenience in your body, and some little need in your family. We're talking about the whole congregation of Israel. God saying, I'm going to destroy them. And then this leader knew that he had to intercede for them. And then he said, I fell down before the Lord as at the first, 40 days and 40 nights. Can we do that? Are we so determined? Are we so dedicated? That we can stay in the presence of God and we say, it may take weeks, we're going to pray. Can we even fast? Except when we want children. Except when we want healing. Except when we're looking for job. Except when there's a problem with our children. Then we begin to fast and pray. But when the church is going down the drain and we can't see our signs anymore, and there is lukewarmness and coldness. Can we do like Moses and go back to the Lord and really pray? That's what it will take in 1 Samuel chapter 15. 1 Samuel chapter 15 verse 10. Then came the word 
of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repented me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he is turned back from following me, and has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord, How long? Please, how long? Has it grieved you to that point? If you came here on Tuesday, and then I began to tell you how far gone we are, how the problem is, what the condition of the church is, and then if all of a sudden I say, see our problem. And we're going to pray, we need to intercede. And I say the Lord is leading now, if I said that, that we'll be here for the rest of the night. It was surprising there will be some people there that will hiss. There will be some people there that will say he has come again. There will be some people there that will say what came on him now. There will be some people there that will say that that's why we have a problem with him. That's why we, we try to caution him and we try to control him. That's why we're doing all this. You see what he has said now? He said we're going to remain here for the rest of the night now. We're going to pray because the church is not doing well. You see, when leaders don't have the burden and the concern, and there is, no, there, there, there is no desire to have a sacrifice that whatever it will take, we're going to do, we're going to consecrate ourselves so that this church will come back again. And part of what I'm doing, like uh, these days now, that we're trying to make the message a little bit longer, it's not that we I just woke up one morning and said, okay, I'm going to make it long. It's because I've seen that now uh, what the church needs now, if it were possible, two hours message. Or preach for one hour, tell them to rise up and pray. And they pray and pray. Say, sit down. And then you say, as I was saying. Then you start again. I think we need that now. Because if you know what is going on in the districts, it's a long, long story. If I ask you now, how many of you in the districts are so free that nobody is accused of witchcraft? That is, in your district, you have never heard any complaint about this one is a witch, that one is a witch. If I say raise up your hand, no complaint in your district at all, it will be difficult to find a hand raised up. Am I right? Why don't you know deeper life? When we're having Thursday meeting here, didn't you hear those testimonies? Of the women that came and said, I went to that church, I destroyed them. I went to that church, I destroyed them. I went to that church, I destroyed them. Didn't you hear the people that said, they killed their own children. They said, then they said, the next on our timetable is deep alive. And immediately they came here. Once they entered into that gate, they began to confess and fire began to burn them. Deep alive. It's not like that today now. We are now afraid of them. In the past, they were afraid of us. That's why I'm concerned. I'm waiting for the moment. When once again, not even in the district, not even in the central church, even in your place of work, even on the street, somebody that did not know you before, if that fellow is a witch, you are coming like this, and the fire of God is in your life, you look straight at him, you look straight at her, and the fellow begins to tremble and shake. He says, have mercy on me, have mercy on me. I will not do it again. I will not. You say, what is it you are doing? And begins to confess on the street. I think that revival time, it will come back, it can come back, and it must come back in Jesus' name. If it is going to be so, you are going to give everything it takes, and you are going to wait upon the Lord and say, Lord, we are sorry for our impatience. We are sorry for our running away from your presence. Now, everything it takes, we are going to do, and we will do it in Jesus' name. Each leader or worker then must pray. For the continuous presence and power of the Holy Ghost. And we must be fervent in prayer. That means agonize in prayer. If you get hold of that book, Why Revival Tarries, buy it, read it, and work on it. It says, uh, instead of the church agonizing in prayer, they are organizing programs. And as they organize, but they don't agonize, 
then there is no revival. And it's happening already. But I pray that God will help us and things will be turned around in Jesus' name. Number two. Fearlessness and firmness of purpose. If we're going to make any change at all, and this is a good time to think about it. Because, you know, this year is the last year in this century. We're moving on now to another millennium, 2000 AD. And I'm wondering whether the same coldness we see now, the same lethargy that we see now, the same backwardness that we see now, and the same lack of righteousness and fiery holiness that we see now. I'm wondering, I'm really wondering whether we're going to carry it to the new millennium. Is that what you want? I said, is that what you want? No. Then, there must be a fearlessness and firmness of purpose. In Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1. Verse 8. We know the verse, but it's not just knowing it. It's translating it, transplanting it into our very hearts and lives. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he will not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat. Whatever it is that you see makes you look warm, makes you to be a kind of leader that doesn't have the authority and the power, the anointing, the unction, the insight, and the fervency that you ought to have. You make up your mind, you purpose in your heart. This time, all these things will go away from our lives, and they will go away in Jesus' name. And then you make your commitment and consecration here. And after making that commitment and consecration, in Judges chapter 11, Judges chapter 11, Verse 35, and it came to pass, when he saw her, he wrenched his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, thou hast brought me very low, thou art one of them that trouble me. Everybody now will read the rest together. For, read it out loud, for I have opened my mouth unto the Lord. And I cannot go back. That's the purpose of heart. You take a decision here. You say, yes, we're going to have revival. Whatever it is that is going to hinder the revival, we're going to cut it off. Your right hand. Or it is your right eye. Anything so precious to you that will hinder you from being a part of the people that will bring back the revival, say that thing will go. And then you may discover a close friend, a close relative, an intimate person. While we're crying, and while we're weeping, and while we're calling upon the Lord, saying, Oh Lord, we're not happy with the condition of our church. This close fellow, this intimate one, this one, like, like your bosom friend. Oh, he says, what big deal is in it? Are we going to bring revival? The church is too large. My mom must eat. And then begins to joke. You will not pet him. You will not pet her. You know that the time has come. To cut off that individual. You said, I've opened my mouth to the Lord. There will be no friend. There will be no relative and there will be no worker in this church that will influence me or influence you to just give up to the devil and say, well, it's not possible to bring back revival. Let's go on the way things are. Things must change. Things will change. Whatever it will take. Things must change and things will change. Now, think about it. What other church does God have in this country in Nigeria? In this continent of Africa, that God can bring the revival fire of holiness back again. As bad as things are here, it looks like it is worse in other places. Is that right? That's why we must then buck up and stand up and then do what we ought to do. You'll do like Esther. Esther chapter 4. 
in Esther chapter 4, from verse 12. Esther chapter 4, verse 12. And he told Mordecai Esther's words. Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther. Think not of thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house. More than all the Jews, for if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall enlightenment and deliverance arise for the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knowest whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Who knows whether you came into the kingdom for such a time as this? And think about it. Only one life to live. And it will soon pass away. What are you going to do in this single life? That you'll make a mark on the church. A good mark. Not a bad mark. A good mark. Not an evil mark. A good mark. Not a mark of sorrow. That you'll make a mark on the church at this time. Who knoweth whether you came into the kingdom at such a time as this? Then Esther bade them return to Mordecai this answer. Go gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan and fast ye for me. And neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. And I also and my maidens will fast likewise. And so will I go in unto the king which is not according to the law. Everybody read the rest. And if I perish, I perish. That is, we don't care what will happen to us. We don't care what people will do. Because bringing back revival is not an easy thing. Satan will threaten and fight. Perils will blaspheme and intimidate. Nebuchadnezzar will be full of fury and fire. Even Ahab and Jezebel may conspire and plot. Even members of our congregations and the districts, they may reject and resist the word. But then you say it doesn't matter. We're not thinking about ourselves. I do not care what happens to me. This church must come back to where it was before. And Christ must take his rightful place in this church. The center of the church. And Christ must rule and reign within this church. It's not going to be a simple matter in these last days. It's only those who are fearless in their principles. Only those who are firm in their purpose that will be able to snatch sinners away from the hands of Satan. But I know we can do it. And we will do it. I said we will do it. Number three, faithfulness in preaching. Faithfulness in preaching. Uh, we know the word. We understand the word. We have been taught the word. What remains now is to give it out. Give it out to the people. Proclaim it. Preach it. But brothers and sisters, it's not always easy. Sometimes if you're a preacher, you'll say if you had been another ordinary Christian, it might have been easier for you because all you do is come to church, hear the word of God, go back home, and just do the will of God, obey the word of God. But when you have to be among the people that stand up to declare the totality of the word of God, and to declare it with authority. It's not always easy. Let me show you why. In Jeremiah chapter 26. Jeremiah chapter 26. Verse 2. Thus says the Lord. Stand in the courts of the Lord's house. And speak unto all the cities of Judah. Which come to worship in the Lord's house. All the words that have commanded thee. To speak to them. Diminish not a word. That's not easy. If so be they will hear. And turn every man. From his evil way. That I may repent. Relent me of the evil. Which I purpose to do unto them. Because of their evil doings. Verse 12. Then speak Jeremiah. Unto all the princes. Unto all the people saying. The Lord sent me to prophesy against this house and against this city all the words that ye have heard. Therefore now, amend your ways and your doings and obey the voice of the Lord your God. And the Lord will repent of him 
of the repent him of the evil that he has pronounced against you. As for me, behold, I am in your hand to do with me as it seemeth good and meet unto you. Why did he say that? When he spoke the word, and he said it with all sincerity, some people said, This fellow, get rid of him. He ought to die. And then Jeremiah heard about that, that they were conspiring to kill him because of the word he preached unto them. That's why he said, As for me, behold, I'm in your hand. To do with me as it seemeth good and meet unto you. Verse 15. But know for a certain that if ye put me to death, ye shall surely bring innocent blood upon yourselves and upon this city and upon the inhabitants thereof. For of a truth, the Lord has sent me unto you to speak all these words in your ears. He told them, He said, I know what you are planning, I know what you are up to. But there is a commission upon me, he said. And if you do what you are planning to do, that's all right. But know of a certain that if you do that, you'll be fighting against the Lord. Because the Lord has sent me to speak these words unto you. When you preach the word in your district, in your location. And then the people say, that's too hard. That's too harsh. That's too long. Why should he do like that? And then they decide they want to do anything. It's going to take faithfulness on your part to still come back and emphasize that same holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Otherwise, if you are not of the, of the mold of Jeremiah, you are going to be afraid and you are going to say, I don't want to lose my life. Ah, immediately you say that, you have forgotten the word of God. He that tries to save his life shall lose his life. But he that loses his life for my sake, he will gain it. He may not gain it here like Stephen, he will gain it on the other side. I pray God will give us the boldness. God will give us the authority. He will give us the faithfulness. We will declare the word of God as it ought to be declared in Jesus' name. In uh, Jeremiah chapter 36, Jeremiah chapter 36, reading from verse 21. In this uh, part of the scripture, it says, So the king sent Jehudai to fetch the roll. That's the word that Jeremiah had written down through Baruch the secretary. And he took it out of Elishama, the scribe's chamber. And Jehudai read it in the ears of the king, and in the ears of all the princes which stood beside the king. Now the king sat in the winter house in the night month, and there was a fire on the hearth burning before him. And it came to pass that when Jehudai had read three or four leaves, he caught it with the penknife, that's the king, and he cast it into the fire that was on the hearth, until all the roll, the written word of God, was consumed in the fire that was in the earth. Yet, they were not afraid nor rent their garments, neither the king nor any of his servants that heard all these words. You see what they did? When Jeremiah gave the word to them, they got the role, they got the writing, and when the king heard a part of it, he said, bring that thing. And he caught it with knives and threw it into the fire. Now if you come into a situation like that, where you preach the word, and the leadership, the kings, the princes that ought to hear. Instead of hearing, instead of accepting, they decide that what they are going to do is to throw the word away. Oh, you become fearful, you become intimidated. This is a waste of time. They will not hear, they don't have any interest. They have interest in other things. Maybe you are chicken out of that kind of a situation. But look at verse 25. Nevertheless, it says... These other people had made intercession to the king that he would not burn the role, but he would not hear them. And then eventually he was even looking for Jeremiah and for Baruch. But look at the latter part of that verse 26. But the Lord hid them. Oh, thank God our lives are in the hands of God. And even though they may want to destroy us and kill us because we are preaching the word of God. He that commissioned us is able to hide us in his pavilion. And uh, we cannot die until our time is up. And if you hear that I die, uh, don't cry unnecessarily. It's because the time is up. It's not caused by any man. 
because the time is up. And then it says in verse 27, Then the watch of the Lord came to Jeremiah. After that the king had burnt the roll, and the words which Baruch wrote at the mouth of Jeremiah, saying, Take thee again another roll, and write it, write in it all the former words that were in the first roll, which Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, had burnt. He said, Jeremiah, your work is not finished yet. They burnt the first one. Take the roll again, write it all over again. Oh, that is going to take faithfulness on your part. Faithfulness is the key in serving God. When the heat is intense, when the storm is fierce, <clears throat> when the fight is hard, when the way or the road is rough, when the opposition is high, when the cross is heavy, when the world is harsh and unfriendly, the word is faithfulness. And then you tell the Lord and you tell yourself whether there is success or failure. Whether there is joy or sadness in service. Don't think that every time you preach, every time you minister, every time you serve, you are going to be full of excitement and joy. You know, Moses was not always full of joy, but he was faithful. And Joshua was not always full of excitement and joy, he was faithful. And you think about Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. He was not always full of excitement and joy. You know the mistake we make? We think, if I'm serving God right, if I'm doing what is right, I would always be full of joy. I can't tell you that. Oh, sometimes there will be joy, a few times. A lot of times there will be sadness. But the key is faithfulness. That whether there is joy or sadness, or whether there is cooperation or resistance, whether others are fervent or lukewarm, whether they accept or reject the message, you make up your mind, you are going to be faithful. Faithfulness in preaching. And faithfulness in the preacher. And it must not fluctuate with the mood of the times, of the climate of the seasons, of the attitude around us. What are we talking about? That if we are going to be the leaders that God wants us to be, there will be faithfulness. With each of that faithfulness, we can rise as high as heaven. Without each, we can sink to the lowest hell. I pray God will make us faithful. Number one, fervency in prayer. Number two, fearlessness and firmness of purpose. Number three, faithfulness in preaching. I pray God will do it in us. Because if it's not done, this church will not be able to recover what we have lost. But we need to recover what we have lost. Now we're going to pray. Bringing back revival is not child's play. It's not a joke. And it's not going to come by just, you know, rounding up and just praying for two minutes. Please rise up. Fervency in prayer. Fearlessness and firmness. In principles and purpose, faithfulness in the preaching of the word of God. Are you concerned about the condition of this church? Are you concerned about the lukewarmness? Are you concerned about the backsliding? Are you concerned about the rebellion we see in the church? Are you concerned about the church almost like any other church now? Are you concerned about the instability of our members? Running to the valley, running to the mountain, running to the seashore. Are you concerned about children in this church? Members of this church carrying bottles of oil, about burning candle, even some of them. Going to prayer meetings where they don't stand upon the word of God. Are you concerned? Are you concerned about the spirit of fear that has arrested the minds of the leaders? Coordinators are afraid. Women coordinators are afraid. Zonal leaders are afraid. Women leaders are afraid. We cannot talk to members of the church anymore. We are afraid of witches. We are afraid of wizards. We are afraid of little children with familiar spirit. We are afraid of what the people will say. We are afraid of what the people will do. We cannot stand and declare the word of God anymore. Is that not a pitiful situation? 
Are you not concerned? We were ahead. We are almost tail now. Are you not concerned? There was healing. There were miracles. And now people, they pray, pray and pray and there is no answer. Are you not concerned? Are you not concerned? There are people who are not holding on to Christ alone. Are you not concerned? They want to add something to Christ. For them, Christ is no more complete. Are you not concerned? Are you not concerned? They are taking away my Lord and I don't know where they lay him. They are taking away the power of Christ. They are taking away the light of the world. They are taking away the doctrine. The doctrine we used to hear and we tremble. We hear now and that it doesn't do anything in us. Are you not concerned? Are you not concerned the children of God go into captivity? Are you not concerned this church being under the feet of men? And now they trample over us and now they insult us. And now even the people that couldn't talk to us before, they now control us. Are you not concerned? Are you not concerned that we cannot pray anymore as a church? Are you not concerned we have lost our tears as a church? Are you not concerned there is no fire, there is no light, there is no power, there is no authority, there is no unction anymore? Are you not concerned with the way the services are going on in the districts? They come and they go back, no salvation. They come and they go back, no restoration. They come and they go back, no transformation of life. They come and they go back, no holiness. They come and they go back, no sanctification. They go and they come back and there is no Holy Ghost fire upon their soul. Are you not concerned? Are you not concerned that our people are more concerned about material things now? What shall we eat? Where with us shall we be closed? Where shall we walk? Who shall we marry? When am I going to have a child? When am I going to have this and that? And spiritual things are relegated to the background. Are you not concerned? Like Daniel, you set your face to pray, to dedicate yourself. You decide, you devote yourself to real praying. And you say, yes, Lord, this is the time. Are you not concerned? Sinners are not being converted. Backsliders are not being restored. You are not concerned? Many in the church are backsliding within the church. Are you not concerned? Even people now, they know that we are not the way we used to be anymore. The newcomers are not coming like they used to come. Are you not concerned? Are you more concerned about time? You are more concerned about when we finish rather than what, what we get when we come. Are you not concerned? Are you not concerned there is no fear of God in the church? Are you not concerned that people can do whatever they like? There is no evidence of the fear of God in their hearts in our church. Are you not concerned?